Hi, Oliver. Hi, Bob. How you doing? I'm doing very well. How are you? Can't complain. Let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show, available on both streaming video and via audio podcast. You are Oliver Ber- Berkman, a uh, well-known journalist and writer. Um, you've written a lot of stuff for The Guardian. And in fact, uh, we're going to talk about one very long piece you wrote <laughs> uh, some, some weeks ago in The Guardian uh, on free will. And we're going to get to the bottom of the free will question uh, before we... Finish talking, but you know, first I wanted to mention, um, a book that when this is posted either will be about to come out or will just have come out. And we're actually going to have a, a separate conversation about this, uh, because it's about time management. Uh, time management for mortals is the subtitle and I'm going to seek your guidance there. I am a mortal <laughs> in need of time management guidance and the title is 4,000 weeks. I'm going to even show our video viewers roughly what the jacket looks like. At least that's the jacket on the galleys. I assume that's what the actual book is going to look like. It is, yeah. The only difference there is it's obviously a soft cover and it'll be a, it'll a be hard, hard cover. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. you're worthy of nothing less. Uh, do you <laughs> want to mention any other um, books or things you've written? Uh, I wrote a book called The Antidote. The subtitle is Happiness for People Who Can't Stand Positive Thinking. Uh, that was a few years ago now. Um, no, I think that's that. Uh, that, that's, that's who I am. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so this free will thing, you you spent a lot of time on this piece. You talked to a lot of philosophers and, uh, you know, you, you, you put in your time. And I want to say there's something about the piece uh, that I find alarming, which is you um, <laughs> you seem to have developed at least some degree of sympathy for a school of thought called compatibilism. <laughs> And, and and we'll get to that, but but uh, that that's actually a, a view that's very popular among philosophers. I, there was apparently some survey you you didn't get into this, but but it is the the predominant view among uh, academic philosophers is compatibilism, which is to say that uh, you know it's like I don't know if you're old enough to remember the Certs breath mint commercials. Wrong country, probably. Anyway, regardless well, of how they, they would go, yeah. they would go. One person would go, "Oh, it's a breath mint," and then the other person would say, "No, it's a candy mint." And they go <laughs> back and forth, and then the 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 voice of God would intone, "Stop! You're both right. It's a candy <laughs> mint and a breath mint." And uh, so the compatible say, "You don't have to choose between the idea that you have free will on the one hand, and the idea that." everything is completely determined and you don't have free will on the other, you're both right. Mm-hmm. So I just want to foreshadow that when we get to this part of the conversation, <laughs> I'm not going to be, I'm I, I'm not going to show an ounce of sympathy for this view. And you are showing at least an ounce. Am I correct? Yeah, actually, I was thinking about this conversation. I feel like, the, I feel like I came up with a kind of specifically Bob Wright <laughs> inflected argument for it. So I'll try that out on you later on. <laughs> okay. Well, good luck. <laughs> uh, the, um, so I guess most people know what we mean when we talk about the free will determinism argument. I always think of it as like, if we trust our intuitions about the way the world out there works, like A causes B and it could only cause B. Uh, you know, and so on, and then that's the world of causality. Then we, 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 we reach a deterministic conclusion, uh, and, and, and there seems to be no room for free will because everything was inevitable give, given the universe as it is at this moment and the causal forces that have been set in motion. The rest of eternity is inevitable. So anyone who lives in this universe and thinks they are changing the course of history uh, is diluted. The course of history is inevitable. That, that, that flows from our intuitions about the world out there. But if we rely on our intuitions about the world in here, like how I live my life, it always feels like, like I'm making decisions and, mm-hmm. and I could have worn another shirt than this. Uh, the, um, but I chose this one and that's why I'm wearing this one. And, and I changed history in that moment. Uh, yeah. Is that, is that, is that the way, is that seem fair way to think about the, what seems to be a, a choice? Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, what my sort of starting point in the piece was, yeah, so I chose a different, very, very simple 
deliberately boring choice to to, to illustrate that's, this with. That's right? what I always go with with my pieces is something something oh, well, boring at the beginning. Uh, unfortunately, you sort of do need that because you get into the dramatic choices later on when we talk about whether anyone is responsible for murders and genocide. But but it really helps, I think, to sort of focus in. And, and the example I used in the piece was, you know, you're hungry, so you go to your kitchen and you look at the fruit bowl and there's a banana and an apple and you choose the banana. And it seems really obvious, I think, to most people, certainly to me, that you could have done otherwise, right? Which is to say, as many of these philosophers would put it, you know, if you rewind the tape of history to the moment just before you chose the banana, you could have chosen the apple. So that is what I think is known as contracausal free will. It's a good way of sort of defining what we're talking about here. And the, the, my starting point in this piece, which I think is so extraordinary, is that even before you get into this debate between the compatibilists and the non-compatibilists, like the majority of philosophers, in other words, the compatibilists plus the freedom deniers, all disagree that you could have done otherwise in right. that moment. Right. They, they, all, they all say that um, either that your choice of a banana over an apple was determined since the beginning of the Big Bang, <clears throat> since the Big Bang, or, and then we need this caveat, which I don't want to dwell on because I'm no expert at all, this caveat that uh, from quantum physics that yeah. certain things do seem to be truly random in reality, so they can't be predetermined. But equally, there's no more freedom in being subject to random forces than there is in being subject to predetermined ones. Everyone involved in the key argument that I was looking at in the piece starts from an agreement that actually, in some sense, you couldn't have chosen the apple. And the debate is then between the majority of them, the compatibilists who think that that doesn't mean you're not free in some meaningful sense, and then the freedom deniers, who I think both of us have an intuition in favor of, um, that of course it means you're not free in any meaningful sense, because like you never had a choice but to take the banana instead of the apple. Um, so what could freedom possibly mean if uh, if it's yeah, not I, that? I mean, I'm I'm personally studiously agnostic um, on on the free will question. So I'm not I'm not I am in none of the conventional camps. I don't I don't have a position. Um, and, and in fact, I, I kind of think that that's the only reasonable position. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> something I feel about all my positions, in fact, uh, as it happens. <laughs> but. Um, uh, I mean, just so you want to hear that argument that everyone should be a free will agnostic? Yeah, definitely. So, as I said, from one point of view, if you look at the way the world out there, it seems like you should be a determinist. On the other hand, it feels like there's free will. Um, I guess I'd say, okay, let's go with the determinist view. It, it's true that, like, uh, you know, science, you know, Newtonian physics, and then. Einstein's revision of that, those are all deterministic. And as you suggested, the new wrinkle, quantum physics, since then, by conventional interpretation, uh, although it's not deterministic, what it says is that there is true randomness, like true randomness, like uh, I'm about to make a decision, and, and if it's a decision that is influenced by something at the quantum level, well, there's a coin flip that I have no control over. It's heads, I do one thing. It's tails, I do another. Uh, and, and so even if that has influence, that's still not what we mean by free will. Right. Uh, uh, and, and, and so that is the conventional, I would say, argument of a, of a scientifically minded person, like I think you or me. Uh, against free will, but, but what I would say is, okay, but first of all, quantum physics has so many weird things about it. I mean, I mean, the basic take home of quantum physics seems to me to be, we really don't seem capable of conceiving what the ultimate nature of reality is like. Quantum physicists don't agree with one another about right. what it all means. You know, the familiar things, wave particle, superposition, entanglement, and, and, you know, they're, they're all over the map. 
Yeah. There, there yeah. are even some physicists who believe that uh, the, the conscious act of uh, uh, measurement, um, the consciousness part of measuring something can influence physical reality. Not many, but there have been some serious physicists who believe that. They're all over the map. Uh, so that should just give us some humility about, uh, I, I think, um, drawing any conclusion, uh, about free will based on our, what we think we know about how the physical world works. But then the other, the other source of humility, it seems to me, should be just the fact of consciousness, the fact of subjective experience. That doesn't follow from anything in physics or, or even I would say biology or anything. Science has no explanation. Uh, a, for why it's like something to be alive, uh, mm-hmm. or B, if they even had a good explanation for why it is, uh, they have, they, they, they still have no good model for what the interface would be between the material world and the, and the world of subjective experience. Um, and, and since subjective experience is, is that, is implicated in free will, I mean, that, that is the realm within which the intuition favors free will right i mean i mean consciousness yeah, no, is a yeah, part of the discussion yeah. and we just don't have a clue and, and and again i mean there are people who think we do have a clue um dan dennett thinks we have a clue um but but i feel about that the way i feel about in fact even more strongly than i would argue that the only reasonable position on free will is agnosticism i would argue that if you think we understand consciousness fully you are deeply confused. I feel very confident of that position. <laughs> right. Um, I mean, yeah, I guess there's a distinction to be drawn here between something that is like, as I understand the position called mis- Mysterianism. Mis- in, Mysterianism on consciousness, yes. consciousness, which I think is something to do with not just we don't know, but that we have reason to believe we can't know. And so... Yeah, I'd probably it, go that far. That, right. that, 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 yeah. Yeah. I mean... Yeah, the question in my mind is how far is what you're saying any different from just saying, like, we don't know the answer to this puzzle. Correct. We don't know the answer to this puzzle. Uh, that's it, what, it is, agno- yes, that's what right. I mean by agnosticism. Right. I mean, on free will. Right. Uh, but, but, but part of the basis for that argument is that, yeah, we, we don't understand consciousness. And that clearly, you know, a complete view, a comprehensive view of our situation. I- including the question of free will, it seems to me would include a true understanding of consciousness, which A, we definitely don't have now, and B, we may well never have. It may be in the nature of being a subjective being in this universe that we can't understand the connection of the subjectivity to the universe. Right. And this definitely gets brought in. I mean, I think um, it often gets brought in in favor of compatibilism, in favor of saying that uh, you know, I, I know that uh, Eddie Namius, for example, who I spoke to for the piece who you've had on the um, on the on, show, yeah. thinks that, you know, a lot of the reason that people are fond of the idea of deterministic arguments and the idea that we don't have free will as a result is is simply because we don't yet understand the ways in which conscious intentions uh, translate into actions that we take in the world. Um, but that's no reason to say that we don't have free will. Uh, I think he would argue maybe that it's a reason for saying that we, that we do. Uh, you're arguing that it's a reason for saying we, we can't know. It's, I mean, the, the crazy thing about this whole field and the thing about doing this piece was just that, like, you know, that, that, that effect that you may be familiar with, uh, of completely agreeing with the most recent person you've spoken to is just compl- is just totally turned up to 11 because we are dealing with like yeah as you said like two completely internally coherent ways of thinking about the world that absolutely uh-huh. don't don't mesh and i'm sure that consciousness has to be has to be some part of the reason why they, you would why they don't mesh yeah. now the way now the very first part of your piece is interesting because it kind of establishes uh the stakes of of this argument um at least for some people it has real stakes there 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 are apparently people who say their lives have been ruined by philosophers who argue there is no free will right i mean these philosophers get emails from people who say you ruined my life i used to think i had free will then i 
read your your paper in some journal or something. And, yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, Galen, Galen Strawson, uh, who's a, who's a freedom denier, a no freedom theorist, um, and several others have had like, you know, lots and lots of kind of strange email up to and including threats of violence that they've had to call the police in to deal with because it's like identifiable people mentioning their family by name and all this kind of awful stuff because they do think that, um, the, these ideas seem to have a kind of cause a kind of, psychological collapse of some kind for people who sort of, I presume they're sort of following the logic through and not being able to dispute it and then seeing what that means or what they think it means for the meaning of their lives and, and having a crisis that way. And actually, um, Sam Harris, who I'm sure we're going to mention a few times in this, in this conversation for, for good or ill, um, he started putting these little disclaimers on the beginnings of the podcasts and the other talks that he does now on free will saying like, you know, if this troubles you, just give it a miss. There's no need for you to listen to what I'm about to say, because there are clearly people in the audience who find it kind of fundamentally distressing to think that, uh, nothing they have done, they can truly take credit for, um, that when they, in the example given in one of these emails that Galen Strawson got that, you know, you can't, uh, you, that, that this person saying that they can't legitimately praise their six year old son for all the accomplishments he has because, because it was all just a given in the unfolding of the universe. Um, I mean, there's a little part of me that thinks that, that the difference between sanity and insanity here is just your, is just that your willingness to not follow these things through to their logical conclusions, right? That actually the, the way to stay sane in the face of, uh, of arguments against free will is that, is that we don't tend to really, um, think through all the way to the end what, what these things I entail, uh, and that people who do, uh, go the crazy. They can, uh, uh, there's a little bit of me that is surprised that it has such dramatic effect on people because in my own life, I've thought about it a lot. I've been thinking about this since I was in high school. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I, I, and I've had my, I was a hardcore determinist then. Um, and I've been through my phases and I don't think it's ever really deeply affected the way I behave. Right. I've always felt, felt guilty when I felt I did something bad. I've always, uh, been mad at people who did things I considered bad. <laughs> now, <laughs> you know, the, the idea that there's no free will does, as you note in the piece, it, it, it can have some good consequences. It can, uh, make you more, uh, forgiving of people. Um, and by the way, I want to get back into the whole compatibilism thing and, and yeah, get yeah, back into sure. the issue per se, but, um, uh, we, we will settle the issue of whether it exists by the end of this, but, um, uh, so relieved. uh, but, but first in terms of the stakes, I mean, you note that among the, the good consequences can be that you, uh, uh, you have a more forgiving attitude toward, uh, other people, right? And toward yourself, right? Right. Totally. I mean, I think it's, if you really think about the consequences of the argument here, it means that, you have to sort of take ultimately any bad action that somebody else commits as a case of there, but for the grace of God go you, right? I mean, that if you had been born with that person's genes and experienced that person's upbringing, you would be that person. And, uh, and, and, you know, it's, it, uh, that has some scary consequences in terms of moral responsibility, but it does have a sort of, in an immediate sense, it has a kind of, it has a kind of softening, uh, effect. I think it's a way of, uh, combating, you know, the fundamental attribution error, the, the tendency we have to see other people's wrongdoing as core to their personalities, where, where ours are just situational and to be forgiven. There's a kind of solidarity that here we all are, um, subject to the same endless causal flow going back to the beginning of time. Um, and on the other hand, you know, you get people like Saul Smolansky, the philosopher at the University of Haifa, who I spoke to, who is very, like, 
warm and witty and and funny person, but who sincerely believes that even though there isn't free will, in his opinion, like we should do all we can for this not to get about, because the more people that believe it, the worse things are going to happen. People are not going to be willing to sort of, um, you know, fight for good causes and or sacrifice their time or even their lives for good causes, you know, because because they're going to think, oh, hold on, why should I do that? Because there's, you know, I, I, I'm anything I do is just caused from that they're, they're going to feel that any choice they make is justifiable on the grounds that that they didn't really have a choice. Yeah, I hadn't uh, seen this term. Illusionism is the term, right? For his view that, yes, free will is an illusion, but we should try to sustain the <laughs> illusion uh, right. for the good of the people. They're, after all, they're not as smart as we are, so we will decide what they should, when they should believe untrue things and when they should believe true things. Well, the thing is, in, I mean, what I'm, I'm at pains on, but he doesn't need me to defend him, but I think that what's so sort of interesting about Smolansky's position specifically is like, he is not the the elitist or the snob that that view seems to imply. I think he is someone who's probably maybe like quite a, quite a lot of um, philosophers who take this stuff incredibly seriously, like, you know, a very sensitive person who feels that on some level um, his life has been worse than it would have been by having discovered this the, 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 this thinking and I not see. wanting to inflict on others. So I think, you know, I don't so think he, it's necessarily that kind of... Uh, he wants to spare people the suffering he <laughs> has endured. Well, that is a better than than uh, than garden variety elitism, I will say. <laughs> um, you know, but but another realm in which I, I, per, I have tended to think it may not matter as much as, much as people think is... Criminal justice. It's, it's like the, you know, they, they, I don't know if you remember like the Twinkie defense, for example. Yeah. The, the, where in a case decades ago, uh, somebody are, some defense lawyer argued, I think maybe successfully that a, I guess a murderer had been, uh, had eaten too much junk food, food and due to high blood sugar <clears throat> or something had, you know, yep. had no choice but to kill somebody. Um, and, uh, and, and so everybody was worried. Well, the more we know about the effect of, uh, you know, chemicals on behavior, uh, the more people are going to get off for crimes. And well, here it is decades later. We actually do know a lot more. And I don't think it's had much of an impact. I mean, people have such a strong intuition that uh, people who do bad things should be punished that they vote to punish them. Now, maybe that will change. And and it's certainly true that you would think you can't have it both ways, right? You, you would think that you can't, uh, on the one hand, use determinism to be more forgiving in those cases where being harsh doesn't do you any good, like just forgiving a friend for something or just, you know. Um, and then on the other hand, at the same time, uh, be unforgiving when it comes time to punish somebody in the criminal justice system. You might think that that's asking a bit much, and maybe it is. Uh, but I certainly, I don't yet see the criminal justice system falling apart because people don't believe in free will. Maybe I'm... Um, no, I think that's right. I mean, I think nobody would argue in this debate that, that a lack of belief in free will has, has sort of permeated so far that we don't, um, that, that America certainly, you know, or most countries, but America especially just sort of fails to punish, uh, any criminal it possibly can to the maximum degree that it can. The, the worry there, of course, is that we maybe shouldn't be doing this, right? That, 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 um, that that it's actually that there's something to the Twinkie defense. I, I use this I use this case in the piece about um, this famous case of Charles Whitman, who um, was one of the early and still one of the worst in terms of casualties mass shootings in America. Who who appeared to be aware in the closing days of his life before um, before his murder spree that he had you know something strange going on in his brain and asked for an autopsy to be done after he died. And, uh, and a brain tumor was discovered that could at least potentially have been mm -hmm. pressuring his amygdala in a particular way that would have caused these actions. 
whether that's actually empirically the case or not, we can put aside. And as various different uh, free will skeptic philosophers have pointed out, you know, what is it if, if that makes you feel that he was a little bit less guilty because he had this brain tumor that was causing these actions? Like, what is it about the um, configuration of brain cells that we call a brain tumor that is any different than any other right. state of the brain? By definition, anyone who does anything bad has got the state of the brain that they had to have to cause them to do it. And maybe, therefore, it wasn't their fault because they, they, they found themselves with that brain state. Yeah. And it does get kind of dizzying after a while. It does get hard. And people like Greg Caruso, another who's gone into the philosophy, who's gone into the sort of criminal justice implications of all this would say that, yeah, huge proportions of what, what we do in criminal justice, especially in this country, are just completely unjustifiable on the basis of, of this yeah, understanding no, of free will. I, I, I basically agree. I've had him on the show too. Um, right. And uh, yeah, I should say, first of all, although I'm agnostic on the issue of free will, I do, I'm enough of a determinist to say that by and large there, but for the grace of God, go I. I mean, you know, you just can't, for one thing, you can't argue with certain just kind of statistical things like, look, if you're born in this neighborhood or born at this income level or born, you know, then the chances are, you know, you're, you know, then you are much more or more, much less likely to wind up in jail. You, you know, you just can't argue that, uh, right. you, you can't fail to see that circum, that, 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 uh, circumstance that, that, that is fundamentally a matter of luck, like where mm -hmm. you were born, who you were born to, uh, is very important. So, so I think that is the proper attitude. Uh, and, and my own view, uh, I think aligns with Greg's on punishment. In fact, I made the argument in my, um, my book long ago, The Moral Animal, uh, that we should, that we should never view punishment. We should never view retributive punishment as a moral good. That, that there's nothing good uh, about punishing wrongdoers in and of itself. Mm -hmm. And that I didn't argue that just out of determinism. I was also noting that we, through evolutionary psychology, we now have a pretty good idea of where um, the retributive impulse comes from. It's just another evolved thing that came in handy. Th this intuition that, that, that uh, people who do bad things should be punished. And, and for that reason, we should be, skeptical of it i think uh but greg i think acknowledges there sometimes you have to put people in prison like if if they will kill again and i think you you might know better than i do that he also um acknowledges the role of deterrence i mean i certainly think sometimes you put people in prison uh to deter others from repeating their crimes and that those are the only two good reasons to do it a to keep them off the street if, if if they're likely to commit the crime again and b to deter others but uh but the idea that it's a good in and of itself to punish them i think is wrong and that's his view right right i mean a, a sort of confounding factor in this is that everybody involved in these debates in philosophy faculties and american universities is all are all super liberal on questions of criminal justice right mm -hmm. nobody nobody thinks the current uh, setup is a good or just one. Um, the question is how far their views directly connect to their skepticism about free will. And I think Greg is one of the people who, you know, would go even further than the, his views on free will dictate in terms of, um, um, uh, what he calls the public health quarantine model of, uh, of criminal justice, where you're sort of the set, the right that you have to keep someone away from the public is the same right that you have to force someone with Ebola mm -hmm. to stay away from the public. You know, that doesn't justify making their lives unpleasant. doesn't justify keeping them detained any longer than you need to, to protect other people. But you do have, there is a sort of community safety uh, justification that we sort of all accept. If someone had Ebola and wouldn't quarantine themselves, we would, we would think it was okay to although the, deter the de although the deterrence factor is a separate uh rationale right for for yeah. in that sense it's not just like quarantining them so long as they are likely to commit the crime right um, yes there's also to do with advertising that this is what happens if you don't do do this or that now there is a paradox here which or a sort of paradoxical seeming point which a few people raised in email in response to the piece and which i 
cannot settle to my own satisfaction, so maybe you can, which is the sort of response that goes, why are we even talking about this? If there's no free will, then, like, the criminal justice system is going to be whatever it's going to be. And um, uh, maybe we shouldn't blame, maybe we shouldn't exact retribution against murderers, but how, how can we blame the people who set up criminal justice systems that exact retribution against murderers either? Because everything we're doing here is is outside of the scope of well, see, that, free that's choice. Kind and then of, you sort of have to go home and give up because like, that, what, that's what kind of what I mean about how little difference it makes in real life that you've got all these philosophers who are, uh, who are saying there's no such thing as free will and, and are actually agreeing that what's going to happen tomorrow is already set. And yet they're arguing about what should happen tomorrow, right? right they're right, making right. these arguments about yeah. how we should set up our prisons. And, and, and that's what I mean. I mean, they, they think about this 24 seven. They're convinced <laughs> it doesn't matter what, what, what they think they're choosing. Right. And yet there they are. Now, of course, I guess what they would say is, well, of course, I can't help but act as that was in the cards. Like the right. causal Isn't forces, it it's no, in it, right? No, it's right. like yeah. right. the right. causal right. forces that were in motion when I was born dictated <laughs> that I would be acting as if this matters and saying it doesn't at the same time. I, right. Right. But um, it's crazy. Uh, I, I mean, the, the other uh, related interesting thing about free will is uh, like. Arguably, it is the one doctrine I can think of whose truth may depend on whether you believe it, right? It's like, uh, you, it kind of sometimes seems like if you believe in free will, then you will behave in such, then, then yes, you will exercise it. Whereas if you don't. Uh yeah, I mean, I, th I would say it a bit differently. I don't, I'm not sure it affects the truth about free will, but it's certainly true that there's a lot of research evidence to suggest that whether or not you believe in free will impacts people's behavior significantly. Mainly it goes in a negative direction. It suggests that people who don't believe in free will are more willing to cheat in, you know, the classic social psychology experiments where they get to win five dollars for answering a puzzle where the answers are. Yeah, they, they had somebody read what a, a, um, uh, a Francis Crick. Uh, I think I think that's it, right? Yeah. Um, the, I read a bit of a book that is f to prime them with sort of free will denial. I don't know how many of these things have and survived. Then they, the, and then they cheated on some. Te they were more likely to cheat on some tests after that, or something. Right. Right. I don't know how much of this stuff has how this stuff has emerged from the from the replication crisis, but um, there's a little bit of work in the other direction that suggests it makes people more forgiving uh, and kinder, which you can also see the. The logic of so yeah that's also the case for the sort of illusion so-called illusionism perspective right it's like almost regardless of whether this is a um uh what, what the truth is there there are consequences to what people believe and actually even daniel dennett has argued from a compatibilist place so he's he's not caught in this contradict in this contradictory situation of denying free will but thinking we should claim that it exists but he has argued that it is irresponsible for people to go around, you know, for Sam Harris and others to go around um, putting the determinist, the uh, the freedom skeptical viewpoint in public places. That that Has is he really? A, Has he really? I mean, That's yeah, I, I don't know how, I don't know how sort of how much weight he attaches to that, but he's, he's got this whole thought experiment about how, um, I wait, it's probably too complicated to well, see, try to get it right this, now, but that it, that it is irresponsible to sort of go around telling people that their choices don't This matter. confirms yeah. my suspicion that some people who espouse compatibilism, and then it does, actually are just flat out old fashioned free will desires who <laughs> think that the people can't be trusted with this dangerous knowledge. And so they say, Hey, don't worry. Free will is compatible with determinism. Stop. You're both right. It's a candy mint and a breath mint. And, and, uh, I mean, I don't have any basis for thinking that they're being, uh, disingenuous, except that compatibilism, their, their view strikes me as so crazy that I don't have another explanation. <laughs> um, so, so, so we should, yeah, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, I should, I should try and persuade you of the truth of compatibilism, okay, even, I, though, even though I don't, Believe it so let, let's <laughs> let's move to that part of the conversation. But first, I want to say, I had a uh, this morning. I had a, 
it doesn't qualify as an epiphany, but I was like <laughs> doing my morning meditation and inevitably, I guess, failing to, to do what you're supposed to do when you meditate, which is, well, you're not supposed to do anything, of course. But anyway, my mind was wandering, so I had not yet achieved, uh, you know, any, any, uh, real, uh, calm and equanimity. And, and I was thinking about the free will issue because I knew we were going to have this conversation. And I also taped a conversation earlier today with John Horgan about, uh, uh, quantum physics. He, oh, he says yeah. hello and he's a fan of yours, by the way. Um, the free and, uh, and I was thinking, you know, the many worlds interpretation of quantum physics, w- according to which, you know, at every moment, you know, uh, it isn't that we can't predict whether the particle is, is going to go heads or tails. It's that both happen. Yeah. And at that point, reality splits off and there's two worlds. Okay. And, and, and one in, in one world, Bob has done this and the other Bob has done that. And I was thinking about, you know, you can always revisit your past and think, man, did I make this fundamentally wrong decision at this point in my life? And I was thinking, wait, in the many worlds interpretation, there is a version of me maybe that didn't, even assuming that this was the wrong decision and my life is worse. In the many worlds interpretation, uh, there is some, there is a version of me that didn't make that decision and whose life doesn't suffer from whatever shortcomings mine has as a result of the decision. And inevitably there was going to be both of us and one of us had to be this version of me. Right. And, and so I'm sacrificing so that the other Bob can have a better life. Fine. <laughs> so I just want to point out that there is a way, there's a different way to get, uh, to plug quantum physics into the free will. Yes. Uh, it, it, it's a deterministic, but kind of pluralistic right. scenario. And if that helps I you. Am, uh, yeah, I, yeah. I, I am, <laughs> I'm even less of an expert on, um, any of that than I am on, on any of this. Uh, but I, there I face a sort of problem of, of escalating absurdity. I mean, I cannot, the, the, the many worlds interpretation yeah, seems, seems so profoundly, uh, uh, absurd and, and but it's sort of taken, profligate. That, that but like, it is it, it is taken seriously by a yeah. number of very smart physicists, and that's what I mean. To get back to when I say, look, quantum physics is so disorienting that it should just be all bets are off, right, right, on on an issue like free will, which may well be related to it, right. Yes, no, absolutely. I mean, if people who know what they're talking about can take that seriously, then then who knows what could possibly be the truth about any of this. So, uh, so convince me. So tell us what compatibilism is, what the argument is, and, and convince me that I shouldn't completely dismiss it. Yeah, that's about as far as I can get. I'm not going to try and convince you that it's the, that it's the truth because I think that would be insincere in terms of my intuitions. But as you said, I mean, the, the, the idea here is that yes, we, we do lack contracausal free will. That is, everything is determined in advance plus some randomness bracket that for now. Um, it's exactly as the free will skeptics say, except that doesn't mean that we don't have free will. So you don't have any choice, but to, you couldn't have made a different choice than to choose the banana over the apple and you are still free. And, you know, this is one of those things which I was completely didn't understand until I made several compatibilists kind of lecture me in very simple terms and at the end of that I maybe did understand it just a little bit or almost get there a little bit I think that's as far as I can say um so that the, there are lots of different versions of compatibilism but the sort of basic idea is that you are free when your desires your intentions your capacity to act uh and the outcomes that you achieve through that action all stand in a certain kind of proper relationship to each other, right? Wait, but, say that part again. The, what, what things stand? In I, this may well not be the canonical way of saying it. May, many compatibilists will probably uh, object violently, but it's something to do with having a. It's something to do with your desires and intentions, your capacity to act, and the things that you get as a result of acting on those desires and intentions. All sort of standing in some kind of right relationship with each other. So here's here's one way into this that made a big impact on me. Um, Helen Beebe, who's a philosopher at the University of Manchester and, and gave me a lot of time and help with this piece, um, she sort of defaulted into this very British uh, approach of just saying, 
of the freedom deniers, like, come on, that's just ridiculous. Like, and, and in a way that was quite powerful for me. If I, if, if you decide, Bob, to, that, that you're hungry and you, I don't know what it's always to do with food, these choices, but if you, and you decide you're going to go into the, um, to the store and buy a packet of potato chips. And in another scenario, I hold a gun to your head and say, if you don't go into the store and buy a packet of potato chips, I'm going to kill you. And so you then go into the store and buy the packet of potato chips. Mm -hmm. Like, it's just really stupid to claim that there is no significant difference. Of course there's a significant difference. Well, well, but the, but the, but a significant difference that is relevant to the free will debate because, um, the hardcore freedom skeptic, I think, is required to say that in both those cases, you know, it's just causes acting upon you. In one case, right. the, the causes that made you hungry and made you like potato chips when you were hungry and made you want to go into the store. In another case, it's a guy with a gun. But right. the idea that there is no, as, as Helen Beebe said to me, it's like, I don't really care if you don't want to call that freedom of will. It's still clearly like a really important that's thing a key, that we that's are talking a critical, about. That's a critical admission on her part. That's exactly the point. That's exactly the point. That's not what we mean by 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 free will. I I mean the scenario in which, uh, yes, uh, there's there's no gunman, uh, but in fact, uh, there you know my my um, decision to go get the potato chips is a result of biochemical causes that in turn had their antecedents, that in turn had their antecedents, and so on. So, so in fact, there was never any actual chance that I would do anything other than buy the potato chips. Um, on the one hand, of course, that's different from external coercion. And, and, and if you want, and, and there, we should have different labels for those two uh uh things as as she's suggesting but but when she says i don't care what the labels are that's the point there's well, no yeah. reason to call one free will when what we have always meant by free will is actually something different so this is a funny conversation because i'm sort of ventriloquizing all these um philosophers who i don't even think i agree with but apart from anything else they're all much smarter than me and have dedicated their lives to this so i, sort of I, I would not I, I would not I, leap to that conclusion <laughs> Oliver. Saying, okay all right okay they have yet to convince me they're so what, smart <laughs> so what i wanted to say was here's what i think daniel dennett would say and of course who knows but the but, but the but the figure that is standing in for daniel dennett in my conversation here um you know a desire arises in you for potato chips and you act on that desire and you obtain the potato chips. Like, what is the, what is the thing that you're wanting that is freer than that? The, the desire to, to have the desire, he would say, I think, that to have the desire to go and buy potato chips and, and arising from wherever it arises for that not to cause for that, for you to stand in a relationship to your desires such that you, like, it was kind of, it, it was kind of, the, to be able to separate off from your intentions and your desires yeah. so that they weren't necessarily like what you wanted to do or what you mm-hmm. intended to do would be some kind of mental illness, right? That is, that is some, or, or unless there are external constraints or, you know, addiction is the obvious, is an other obvious example, right? I mean, if you're, if you can, if you can choose, ah, we all, it all just comes back to the same <laughs> objection, right? Well, and, me, and actually, me... and actually, no, and just to, just to quickly get in a little bit here, this is, this is the frustration that my friend uh, Tom Chivers, who was responding to the piece on Twitter, uh, great journalist and author made as well, which is that, you know, at a certain point, this just comes down to semantics. At a certain point, this just comes right. down to, we all agree the world is how it is, apart from the sort of Christian philosophers who believe we have true so-called libertarian free will. No, no, I, no, it's not just them. I'm, I'm an agnostic. I, I just think the world could be so much weirder than we understand. And, and again, I return to this issue of consciousness. We don't have a clue as to the relationship of, quote, us, that is to say the subjective us and the physical world. We don't have a clue. And anybody who thinks we do is deeply confused. I'm sorry. 
<laughs> so, 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 so I, mean, I don't think you have to be a member of any specific religion to at least hold out the possibility that something like libertarian free will Okay, yeah, no, I, I, that was shorthand. What I really mean is the people who are supposedly at loggerheads here, the compatibilists and the freedom skeptics, you know, there is a way of seeing this that all they are arguing about is whether the situation, which they all agree on, can legitimately be called some kind that, that's of That's my point. That's my point. Right, the right. only difference between a determinist and a compatibilist is whether you get cute with your definitions. That's the only difference. Whether you cleverly define free will to mean something that it hasn't traditionally meant. That's mm -hmm. what compatibilism is. And that's all it is, <laughs> Oliver. It's fucking bullshit. Okay? It's people saying, what if by free will we meant something other than what people have always meant by it? Well, yes. yeah, that would change things, wouldn't it? But that doesn't make you some kind of genius and it doesn't solve the problem. Um, I, I have very strong sympathy with that, with that position. I, I, I think there is another way of seeing it. And I think that, I mean, this is the second Wrong. part of this. <laughs> okay, so here's the bit, here's the part where I want to try to persuade you of this from a sort of, from the perspective of your book, Why Buddhism is True. So, uh, your, um, erstwhile sparring partner, Sam Harris, says, and I think he's right about this much. He's a, he's a hardcore free will skeptic. Um, that the free will problem and the problem of the of the self and whether there is whether the thing we think of as a self really exists are ultimately the same problem, right? That um, that in both cases it is this idea that we can somehow get out of the flow of process and sit on a little driver's seat and control and engineer things. Uh, and that actually to do this would require stepping outside of reality, which is a kind of incoherent notion. You can't do it. We are just part of this process and flow. And so it would seem from that that, that you know, that what's wrong with the tr conventional notion of the self is the same thing that's wrong with the conventional notion of free will. Does that, does that make sense? I, I, I think there, yeah, there, there, there are, I mean, there's, there's more than one, I think, meaning of the, uh, the notion, the Buddhist notion that the self doesn't exist, I think has more than one kind of, uh, manifestation. There's more than one version of it, but, but one version of it could be taken to, to be the same as saying free will does not exist. Although interestingly, the issue of free will per se, doesn't really come up much in mm. Buddhist intellectual history. That's just an interesting fact. But, yeah. but yes, the idea that there's no CEO self. Yeah. There's no, there's no, you know, boss from which the orders are being issued, which is one version of the Buddhist idea of not self. Um, that, that could be equated with the idea that, that free will doesn't exist. Traditional free will. And this, yeah. you know, and just as an aside, I think that also explains what Harris means when he argues that the illusion of Free will is itself an illusion, right? That if you really focus, perhaps after an hour of deep meditation, on the way in which your intention to choose a banana over an apple arises, it doesn't even feel free. It really is just a kind of, it just floats up out of the void, out of the blackness. It isn't, um, it, you know, we don't even actually really go through life uh, when we really think about it, when right. we really focus on it, feeling like we are CEOs. Now, I, I think it's true that deep, Meditation and Sam, Sam has, uh, has done more meditating than I have, but it, it, you know, if I think back to kind of deepest moment of my longest meditation retreat or something, um, yeah, there, there are times when it's very much like you're the observer and you're not just observing feelings arise, but kind of thoughts kind of floating right. by. And it's like, oh, I guess that one didn't come from me if I'm, I'm sitting here watching it. Yeah. Um, the, so uh, yeah, go ahead. Well, so here's the part where I try and I'm very confident fail to blow your mind on the compatibilism issue. I mean, the a big as there's something interesting to me in the fact that 
a, a very natural response to um, uh, the idea of free will skepticism is sort of despair and um, the sort of cliched archetypal response to sort of seeing through the um, uh, the illusion of the self in Buddhism and meditation is is liberation, right? It's it's a so there's some. I'm not saying we did also say there are sort of upbeat interpretations of free will skepticism. It's not all it's not all bad, but you know what, if you just focus on the idea of like what is to be gained from seeing through the conventional notion of the self. I I loved your book and read it more than once because I went back to it for sort of structural inspiration when I was figuring out how to oh, write my book. But, but, but I don't have it for basing in my head right now. But I think you're one of the, you talk about how, you know, um, you, you talk about things that follow from getting, from at least loosening the grip of, on this idea of the CEO mm -hmm. self mm -hmm. that are all kind of, I mean, it's there in the word, right? Liberation. There's something free in that, mm -hmm. in that kind of, in that kind of life. You are freer to, relate to people without the shackles of entanglement with ego. You are freer to uh, let go of uh, sort of tribalism, freer mm -hmm. to love. Probably like creative work flows more freely when you're not entangled with the, when you're not identified with certain kinds of egoic needs. And there is this word liberation, which has to do with freedom. That is a, a state that seems meaningfully uh, to be called something like freedom, which is simply to more consciously Occupy your role in the grand flow of, you know, what Joseph Goldstein quoting some ancient older teacher calls uh, empty phenomena rolling on, right? The fact that that's all reality is just, just a, just endless cause and effect, cause and effect. And when you, and, and the act of, and the act of seeing through the self, as I understand it, I wouldn't claim spiritual enlightenment is, is to sort of take that and sort of embrace that that role that you are in that, in that core, the causal web and to, and to feel freed as a result. Well, if that's the same thing as seeing that there's no free will, there is a case for the idea that this is, that this is, it's, sorry, if that, if that's the same as seeing the truth of determinism, mm -hmm. then there is a case that that is freedom because it is precisely, you know, the freedom that Buddhists are talking about when they're talking about, you know, becoming more fully conscious of and embodying your role in the causal chain and the degree to which all you are is processes and, and causes and effects. So, yeah, but there know, is this irony. I mean, I, 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 hence compatibilism can be true because it's because that is a meaningful concept of freedom to be to be in reality in that way, like a well-fitting shirt and to, and to be the channel through which intentions turn into results in the world. Well, uh, I mean, I would say, uh, I haven't played on mine. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just, that was like a conversion experience. That's why I'm pausing. I'm, I, I, I'm just, uh, you're my new guru. Um, the, uh, no, I mean, I want to say a couple of things. I mean, first of all, just to be, to be clear about, um, uh, why I say compatibilists are just redefining terms, it's that historically, the idea that there is free will has entailed the idea that if, you know, if, if 24 hours ago you had known everything about the state of the universe, and I suppose, you know, in the quantum era we would say, plus, how various particles were going to randomly decay, mm -hmm. okay, whatever, then, then you would, or randomly do whatever they do, but, but all of that would be random. That would be noise and you just knew what the noise was going to be, right? Like, if, the point is, if you had known all of that, if you understood mm -hmm. everything there is to understand about physics and you knew all of that, um, you could predict what would happen now, 24 hours later, because there was no chance it would be anything else. Yeah. Um, uh, that's what free will, that, that's what the debate has traditionally entailed is whether or not you think things could have been otherwise. 
Okay. Well, not, the, not the debate between compatibilists and skeptics, right? They, they no, no, the debate the between breath. determinism yeah. and free will. Yes. There yes. has been a very clear distinction between their positions that you can put in concrete terms yeah. and, uh, that I just described. Yeah. The determinists say, if you knew everything about the state of the universe today, you could predict everything that would happen tomorrow. And um, now, again, quantum physics throws this wrinkle in, but by conventional reckoning, we both agree that it's not a it's not a particularly significant wrinkle because it's just randomness that's mm-hmm. being thrown in. So, so just leave quantum physics out of it. Uh, and in any event, none of none of the compatibilists are bringing in quantum physics. I mean, they would make the same argument in a, a completely deterministic uh, universe yes. that they're yeah. making now, yeah. right? So let's forget about quantum physics. And traditionally, determinists has, has said if you knew everything 24 hours ago, you could predict everything about the universe today. People who believe in free will have said that's not true. Things could have been otherwise. This mysterious thing we call free will gets mm-hmm. exercised and it actually changes things such that you could not have predicted them. Okay. Mm-hmm. That difference in in real terms between the positions tells you there's actually a meaningful difference between these positions yeah. and yeah. what what the compatibilists are doing is adopting the determinist position and saying right uh you know if, if you'd known everything 24 hours ago you could predict today right but there's free will and 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 I'm just saying well there's only free will if you change the meaning of free will because as I just explained throughout <laughs> all of time the position of free will has entailed logically the position that you couldn't predict today if you knew everything yesterday they're just redefining the terms and it's bullshit and it's well, because I, they don't think people can – well, this is conjecture on my part. <laughs> they don't think people can 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 stand the truth or something. There's some, for some reason, they're just playing word games and telling us it's deep, and it's not. I, I've got a lot of sympathy for that. I mean, I'm more interested I'm – trying, I'm trying to have a good debate here rather than just uh, agree with everything you say. Um, I think the, the space for objecting there is to say they're redefining the terms and maybe it's not bullshit, right? They're, they're redefining the terms in a way that is compatible with our lived experience if we pay close attention to it, that doesn't need to feel like it makes our lives meaningless, that is, that, 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 um, retains all the significant differences between a person who is addicted and who isn't addicted, a person who is be, has, does have a gun being held to their head and who doesn't, who does have a brain tumor and who doesn't. Um, and yes, it has to reject libertarian free will, but, but maybe that kind of uh, changing of the concepts is not entirely bogus and uh, ridiculous. Look, and, if you want bullshit. to change the concept, fine. Just don't act as if you have just solved an age-old <laughs> debate. Because what you've solved is a different debate. A debate yeah. that actually has no meaning. But if you want to call it a debate, <laughs> fine. Congratulations. <laughs> Hope you get tenure. <laughs> the, the, now on, on the, um, the, the, the Sam's point about the Buddhism, I, I mean, that, that's all, uh, yeah, yeah, there is a kind of liberation and so on. I, I would say there's an irony here, which is that, uh, you know, you mentioned jo- Joseph Goldstein. Uh, but if you listen to the way even he talks, at least in front of many audiences, now this may, and, and he might say this, look, this is just a convenient way of talking, fine. But what he, he says is that if you meditate and just see your thoughts as passing by and your feelings as passing by, you can decide which ones to engage with, which ones to be guided by, mm-hmm. right? So, he, he's he's just kind of uh, removing um, the act of volition by one step. He, he's kind of uh, purifying. I mean, he's saying meditation kind of uh, purifies volition, but the way he's talking isn't eliminating volition. Now he may say, I don't know what what he would say if you said, well, is there volition or not? But but I want to say. You know, it's very common for even very deep practitioners of Buddhism to say that, you know, meditation helps you make wiser decisions. Yeah. Okay, but a decision yeah. is, is a decision, right? That, yeah. That's not 
uh, if this, if the word decision has the kind of meaning we've traditionally assigned to it, then that's not a purely deterministic universe. I, I'm just noting this as a footnote. I'm not, it, it's, um, because I'm not, I, I have not gotten as deeply into the practice as either Joseph or Sam. And, and, uh, maybe, uh, I would, uh, but again, Sam is not a compatibilist, right? I mean, I mean, Sam, or he doesn't call himself a compatibilist. No, no, right? he's, so, the, he's the polar opposite. Absolutely. No, so it, it's, it's, um, uh, you know, I don't think anybody escapes the, uh, contradictions here. And I certainly don't think anybody lives, uh, free will skepticism in a sort of wholesale way. It's very hard to understand what that would even mean. And maybe, maybe that's a, you know, I think one of the things that, you know, there'll be some people listening, watching to this who have completely different approach to these questions. There are kind of Wittgensteinian responses, and there's a whole thing now about the idea that free will might be emergent, a sort of higher level phenomenon. There are a whole, there are a whole lot of ways of looking at this that just completely shift the ground and, and just sort of say, this is all based on a category area, all just talking nonsense around in circles. And I think that evidence for that, and or evidence for your sort of mysterian uh, approach is in the fact that, you know, nobody in this seems to be free from some kind of contradiction. Like the, uh, they are either, you know, using words in the way that words have not traditionally been used while continuing to live their lives as we all do, or they are denying that there is any such thing as free will while plainly every single day having those kinds of attitudes that imply uh, mm. that there is free will, getting angry when people um, cut them up in traffic. You know, everybody ends up backing into some problem here that does sort of lead With you to... With a possible exception of me, you mean, because I'm just <laughs> saying I don't know. <laughs> right. Well, that's the convenient approach, isn't it? Like, you're not going to be wrong if you're saying, if you're not willing to but, but, say what, what right would be. But no, I'm, I'm acknowledging <laughs> that wasn't nice, by the way. You could have said that in a nicer way, but I, 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 I acknowledge that, no, we all, we all have our paradoxes. I mean, I, it's amazing how firmly you can believe that there, but for the grace of God, go I. And yet, day after day, get mad at people, continue to dislike certain people, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and then you'll have, you'll, you'll like have this moment of reprieve where you just, yeah, you see them, you, you suddenly see them as just like you, kind of, like they, they, you have insecurities, they have insecurities, this is the way they're handling theirs. Mm -hmm. And if you had been born in their environment with their genes, it's the way you'd be handling yours. You have these yeah. moments, but it's, uh, it's very hard to live by them. Um, but that is, uh, but I will say, you know, I mean, back to Sam's thing about liberation and enlightenment, um, I, I do know that you know, when meditation is really working, you know, when, I mean, especially like on a retreat and so on, uh, you're much better at that. You're much, you're yeah. much better at kind of walking the walk. Um, and I encourage that. So have I persuaded you to, am I going to join my, your cult or are you going to join mine? <laughs> it's a good question. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I sort of, at the end of this piece, I kind of, I, I kind of backed out from committing completely to the sort of free will skeptical position that I had broadly been sort of writing in favor of for a lot of the piece because it just seems like, I, what does it mean to believe in something that I violate every single moment of the day in the way that I do? You know, what does it mean to say I don't believe in free will and then live the way I do with every, my yeah. every, my every minute infused by an implicit belief in, in free will? Uh, but I totally, I, I think, you know, I totally share your, a lot of your sort of, um, hostility to compatibilism. It comes down ultimately to the moral responsibility stuff, right? I mean, I may, maybe it is meaningfully free to, want to do something and be able to act on that want, even if the want was predetermined. But that still can't possibly be a reason for throwing people in jail for murder if it was always on the cards that they were going to commit that murder, no, no matter no, what I, they wanted to do. You know, I mean, well, the, sorry. No. I was just going to say, I think the enlightened position, the, 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 good, the, the right position is punishment is 
is always regrettable, and sometimes it's a regrettable necessity. And if it's not a necessity, you shouldn't do it. But and I think there there are two justifications for it. Uh, as I've said, keeping them the criminal from repeating the crime and deterrence, and and yeah. there's nothing else in American jurisprudence currently. There is a third rationale right. that is respected, retribution. Now, yeah. I don't know that that very often makes a difference in the sentencing. I don't know. That's an interesting question. But I do believe that uh, every, you know, you, you even use, you you know, you even use the Hitler word in your piece. I don't, I don't, I don't know <laughs> if I can find it, but you use that as an example, which is right. kind of courageous because right. that's the one that's going to get you the most hit, hate mail is the suggest that had you been born in uh, with Hitler's genes and Hitler's environment, I think that's the way you put it, right? Well, I think it was a point that came out of a conversation with Greg Caruso, and I thought right. he made a very good distinction. You do not have to conclude, as people seem to worry that you might have to conclude, that what he did was a little bit less terrible than it was. You don't have to say, well, we've been thinking of Hitler's acts as 100% evil, but in fact, they're only 97% evil or even 0% evil. No, right. you can completely stay committed to how awful it was. You just have to say that a certain kind of personal responsibility that we are, right. that we want to apply doesn't apply. Yeah, that is a kind of a, that's a scary prospect, but it's not as scary as suddenly having to say that there's like no right or wrong or that that was... No, I, know, and in fact, you could say, you know, or the uh, World War II wasn't justified in order to, in order to, in order to stop him. Right, you know, you right. Know. No, you say the magnitude of the evil uh, would warrant uh, the most extreme punishment. Um, but it's still, it's a, it's a hard, it's it's a very hard thing for for you know just human beings to handle the idea of in that in that extreme a case separating the question of moral blame from the question of just appropriate punishment. Uh, in a pragmatic sense. Um, yes, and it might not be actually possible for me to do it in that case if I was, you know, had had closer uh, yeah. engagement with it. It may be just something that you can only sort of do from the luxury of distance. Yeah. No, that, that's what I mean when I say it's very, it's very hard as a practical matter to act on uh, determinism as a... Uh, I'm kind of curious, come to think of it, so how do the compatibles say you should handle these things? I mean... Uh, do they wind up agreeing with Greg Caruso that, uh, that retributive punishment doesn't make sense? Or, or do they say because they're using the word free will, actually it's fine? Or I wonder. Well, no, this is where I, this is where I run into the sand with my attempts to be as charitable as I can with, to compatibilism and back into the, back into your camp because I don't understand. I mean, uh, Caruso and Dennett did a whole book of, of dialogues. It's really interesting called Just Desserts about where they're debating this stuff. And I don't want to accuse Daniel Dennett of, uh, uh, being disingenuous or anything like that, but it just does seem to me like it turns into something like wordplay when you have to start, um, when you have to, 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 to start, uh, saying that somebody is in some foundational sense morally responsible for their act. And at the same time, determinism could be, could be true. Um, uh, Dennett sort of objects to this language of ultimate moral responsibility and brings in other, uh, ideas about, you know, you at time one being responsible for what happens, what you at time two does and all these kind of more sort of, um, uh, low level ideas of, of responsibility, but I did not, if I'm honest, succeed in getting my head around them. And you would say, I think that's because there's a reason they, for that. Are, they are not good ideas. It, is a, know, tribute, it is a tribute to your head that you couldn't, you couldn't get wrapped around them. Um, the, uh, so, okay. So anything else you want to say? Uh, I, I, lest anyone think we haven't completely settled the matter. <laughs> no, I mean, I could talk about this for ages, and I think it is kind of completely, it is completely fascinating. I think that the thing that I really sort of took away from writing this piece, it's uh, many people who want to sort of an answers to these questions will consider it to be a, um, a sort of a, a, a get out or a sort of defeatism or something. But ideas like this can be really powerful therapeutically, you know, ideas like this can be really powerful, the idea of 
free will skepticism to like keep in the back of your mind mm -hmm. and seek to have them kind of work on you a little bit as you go through the day, uh, having your angry responses to people behaving like jerks, um, interacting on social media with people whose opinions are strike you as outrageous. It's there as a kind of a, it, 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 I think like having it in your back pocket exerts a really benef can, can exert a really beneficial effect on, on behavior. And in having a way, de having determinism so, in your back pocket. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. in a way, maybe that's more important than, you know, the, that, that's the sort of, that's where the rubber hits the road. Um, well, see, that, that's the thing. I mean, the tendency for people who worry about the practical consequences of this debate one way or the other, it seems like most of them are in the, the world will fall apart if, if, if the idea of free will collapses camp, right? right? I hear that more often. That was more the kind of email, the philosophers you mentioned in the piece. Yeah. But it seems to me it's really far from clear. As we've noted, uh, a deterministic worldview can lead you to have more compassion for other people, for yourself. Now, yes, you could have, you could have too much compassion, you know, if you just couldn't muster uh, the will to punish someone who for practical purposes needed to be punished or stop some international aggressor. On the other hand, there have been tons of wars that in retrospect were a mistake or right. didn't do any good on balance. Yeah. And part of what got us or somebody else into them was working themselves into a rage about exactly how evil the leader of the other country was or the people were. And, and, and that was very much tied into this notion of, of free will. And yeah. so it's, it's, I, I do think in, in an ideal world, it's almost as like, as if you would deploy for the idea of free will in some cases and the idea of determinism in others. And look, if the compatibilists achieve that, then I will say that their their uh, their idea has had tremendous practical consequences. It is still bullshit <laughs> <laughs> as an intellectual matter. They have not um, so, they have not rendered compatible the two traditional schools of thought that we thought to be in opposition. Those two schools of thought are in opposition. I hope I haven't been too hard on the compatibilists, but... Uh, uh, I'm such a, I'm a kind of... I'm the wrong... I'm such a pathetic person to defend them because I'm just really not willing to well, go to the mat for compatibilism. I did, so. uh, I did have Eddie... Uh, how does he pronounce that? Do you pronounce it num... Anyway, uh, it's, it's Nomius, like, I think, yeah. N-A-H-A-M-I-A-S. N-A-H-M-I-A-S, yeah. Yeah. I had him on. We had the discussion. Uh, and, uh, in fact, I think I got an email from you after it. Uh, commenting on it, uh, one way or the other, but, um. Yeah, no, on, on your side of things, because I still don't understand, uh, how, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, I'm well, still you, ultimately in the, in the, in the camp of, uh, skepticism about this, yeah. So, yeah, I, I, you know, and I'm sorry if I said anything too mean about them. I, I'm not, I'm not their, uh, I'm not their representative. Uh, no, I'm sorry to them. To I'm, I'm not sorry to you. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> In fact, I plugged your book and we'll do it again before we sign off. So awesome. I don't know if – so the pub date is August 10th. The book is 4,000 weeks. I don't know if this will appear before then or after then. The conversation we're going to have about the book, which is important because God knows I need a good book about time management. <laughs> um, I, that, that will appear after pub date and I, and, and I honestly don't know what the sequence will be with respect to this. But if it's before August 10th. People can pre-order the book 4,000 Weeks. Uh, your writing is always a pleasure to read. And uh, you are nothing if not wise. So, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you've had you've had a lapse or two during this conversation, yeah. but it happens to all of us. If I had been born with your genes and your environment, yeah, you would have screwed up. It would, ha it would have happened degree, to yeah. me at some yeah. point in my life. Um, okay, so uh, thank you, Oliver. And Thank you very luck, much. Good luck with the book. Thanks, Bob.